next speaker is uh, Dr. Jeff Chen. Jeff uh, completed his undergraduate degree at Cornell and uh, completed both a medical degree and a master's of business administration at the same time here at UCLA. He's the founder and director of the UCLA Cannabis Research Initi Initiative, and he's going to be talking to us today about uh, the role of cannabis uh, for cancer patients. Dr. Chen. Thank you, everybody. Um, you know, we have uh, Dr. Dean Martin, Dean Kelsey Martin mentioned this this morning, which is we have one of the first university-based cannabis research programs in the world. And being located in California, we have both a very unique opportunity to be a world leader here. California is and will be the largest cannabis market in the world for the next several decades. So we both have an opportunity to be the leader, but also a duty, because everybody can now walk off the street, essentially, and purchase regulated cannabis products with very little knowledge as to the health effects. Um, and so maybe the first question you might ask is, what is the purpose of our cannabis program here at UCLA? And actually, another note, so we're, we're, uh, we were actually initially funded and incubated out of the Semmel Institute for, for Neuroscience here at UCLA. And our mission is really to understand, how does cannabis impact our bodies? How does it impact our minds? And how does it impact society? What are the economic ramifications? What are the sociocultural ramifications, the social justice implications? Um, our program, again, we're based out of the Semmel Institute, but we are, our program extends far beyond that. We have nearly 40 faculty who've joined our program. They represent 17 different departments uh, and eight different schools at UCLA. So a very interdisciplinary collaborative group. It's pretty uh, unusual to see this much uh, multidisciplinary involvement. And so I like to say that we are the perfect example of how cannabis brings people together. Okay, that's, that's the only joke, that's the only pot joke I'll have for the rest of the talk. I just had to get it out of the way. And that's, okay. So today I'll be talking about, I'll give you a brief introduction to what is cannabis, what's in the plant, why does it interact with our bodies, We'll talk about some of the potential that it might have for symptoms that oncology patients face. We'll talk a little bit about how it actually has anti-tumor effects inhibiting the growth of cancer cells. And lastly, we'll talk about the adverse effects, the harms. So first off, what is actually in the cannabis plant? Well, let's talk about the cannabis plant first. So when you hear the word cannabis or marijuana or weed or even hemp, it's all referring to the, the same plant. It's just different variations of the plant, like you have different breeds of dogs. Some dogs are bigger, some are smaller, some are aggressive, some are timid. And it also depends on what part of the plant you're talking about. So when we're talking about the stalk of the plant, that's the fibrous part of the cannabis plant that is used for clothing, paper, construction materials. That's what we colloquially call hemp. It's really the flower of the cannabis plant where all of the medicinal as well as the drug content lies. Also in the flower is where you have cannabis seed, aka hemp seed, the stuff that you buy at the grocery store. Okay, so again, wh whichever parts of the plant you're looking at have different functions and utilities. So now talking about what is in the flower are things called cannabinoids. These are compounds that are relative, that are unique to the cannabis plant. And so there's two cannabinoids, THC and CBD, that are the most abundant as well as most studied. There's also over a hundred other cannabinoids in the cannabis plant, and we have no idea what they do. We've barely scratched the surface. There's a lot we don't know about this plant, and that's because research was systematically uh, hindered, as well as there was no funding for this work for the last 50 years, and there's still not really any funding for this work. That's why we still don't know too much. But here's the two, here's the two cannabinoids that we do know a good amount about. So THC is, THC is responsible for the psychoactivity of cannabis, where CBD does not have any psychoactivity. It's a huge difference. THC also is responsible for the addictive properties, and I'll talk more about that later, whereas CBD has no addictive potential and might even have anti-addictive properties. It might reduce the cravings for other addictive substances, particularly opioids. THC is responsible for the motor impairment, whereas CBD doesn't do that. And lastly, THC stimulates appetite, whereas CBD does not. Okay, so very quickly you see, they're both cannabinoids, they're both from the cannabis plant, but very different properties. But in other areas, they overlap. And actually, for a lot of these areas, we only have animal studies. So it's not, we don't really know what it looks like in humans, but everything from antioxidant properties, anti-inflammatory, anti-seizure, neuroprotective properties. Okay, so in some ways they're different, 
some ways they have overlapping features. And how is it that they impact our bodies? Well, we didn't know for the longest time until about 20 years ago, we discovered endocannabinoids and we named them after the cannabis plant because that's what the cannabis plant is mimicking when it is impacting our bodies. So when you take THC, your body is reacting to the THC as if it's your own naturally produced endocannabinoid, internal cannabis-like molecule. And we initially thought these were just located in the brain where they regulated things like mood and memory, sleep, appetite. But later we found them in your blood vessels where they regulate blood pressure. In your fat, they regulate energy metabolism. In your bone, they regulate bone remodeling. They're on your skin. They're on your immune cells where they regulate inflammation. They're in your major organ systems, your reproductive organs. So the endocannabinoid system is throughout your body and it's involved in a wide variety of physiologic processes. We don't understand the system very well. Cannabis is one way to impact the system, but things like diet, exercise also impact the system. And a little, most people don't know this, but up until about the 1930s, we had federally legal medical cannabis. Any doctor could prescribe cannabis. Pharmaceutical companies such as Eli Lilly created cannabis tincture bottles. You'd go down to your pharmacy, pick it up, and you would use it. So medical marijuana is not a new thing. We had federally national medical cannabis up until about 80 years ago when prohibition began. All right, so let's talk about symptom management in oncology. And so I'll be talking about five areas, and we'll be going through the, with different levels of evidence. And those five are nausea, appetite, pain, sleep, and mood. Mood thing, being things like anxiety, depression. Now, before I get started, a big caveat here. All of the data that I'm about to discuss is either done on pure THC, synthetic pure THC, a combination of a 50-50 combination of THC and CBD, or cannabis, but the cannabis used in these studies was essentially just THC. There was really nothing else uh, in the cannabis plant. And that's because the types of cannabis that were available to researchers over the last 50 years only came from one place. And that one place did not grow cannabis that resembled the cannabis that everybody uses uh, in, the, in, the, in, the, at the, in the state level or in the black market level. And lastly, CBD alone has had very few to little studies. So I know there's this whole hemp CBD craze right now. We don't, know, we don't know what any of that stuff does. We only have anecdotal data on that, okay? So pure THC is still different than high THC cannabis because the cannabis plant has a lot of other stuff in it. All right, so let's get started. Nausea. So ever since 1986, THC, pure THC, has been approved to treat nausea related to chemotherapy. And in fact, it, it, it pure, it's actually more effective than many anti-nausea medications that we use, such as metoclopramide. And it appears to be similar in effectiveness to um, Zofran on Dancitron, which if you have loved ones that, that have experienced nausea, they might have used it. Um, in terms of the medical establishment's usage of THC, it's obviously hindered by the psychoactivity and we don't really have an IV delivery form, right? You can inject someone who has uh, in the hospital with Zofran to quell their nausea. You can't do that with THC. So that's why it's limited some of its application and, and popular usage amongst doctors. In terms of appetite, also since the 1980s, THC has been approved to treat anorexia related to uh, HIV AIDS, which is different than maybe folks who might be uh, having cachexia from cancer, right? But we have studied it a little bit in cancer patients, and we find that patients report, this is in randomized trials, they find that patients report that the food tastes better, they report that their appetite's better, but we actually don't see very much weight gain in cancer patients using THC. So it might be more a quality of life thing. They have the desire to eat more, and um, they enjoy the food better. What about pain? So again, the only studies that have really been done have been oral THC, so taking a, TA, a pill of pure THC, taking oral THC and CBD, a 50-50 blend of THC and CBD, or vaporized cannabis. And that cannabis is still predominantly THC. That cannabis that I'm about to talk about here doesn't have CBD. It has other parts of the cannabis plant, but not CBD. And in all of those studies, you generally find improvements in pain, um, and both in cancer-related pain, where in Canada, uh, CBD and THC is approved by Health Canada for treatment in advanced cancer pain that's not responsive to opioids. 
as well as the other area where we have the most evidence is for neuropathic pain, nerve pain. And that's, that's useful because that's a pain that's very difficult to treat, especially with um, uh, opioid-based analgesics. Here's the other interesting thing. In all these studies, you actually find that you're getting pain relief at low doses of THC. And at those low doses, you're having minimal psychoactivity. So there's a common myth that you need to get really high to get the relief. That's not true. You're finding that when they used low-dose THC, they got pain relief with minimal to no cognitive impairment and psychoactivity. And in fact, they found that about, you know, even five to 10 milligrams of THC was sufficient for pain relief. And the cannabis that they vaporized was only about 3%, three to 5% cannabis, and that was sufficient. Whereas you walk into a dispensary today, you can buy cannabis that's 25% THC, or you could buy, you know, like a, a candy bar that has 100 milligrams of THC. You don't need those doses to get pain relief. You don't want those doses necessarily because of these sedative, the sedative effects, the mind-altering effects. And again, we've never really studied CBD by itself for pain, whether taking it by mouth, whether smoking it, whether rubbing it on your skin, even though you walk into Whole Foods and you can find all these products now. We don't know what CBD actually does. All right, what about on the topic of the ability of cannabis or cannabinoids to reduce opioid usage? So we actually see that as states legalize medical cannabis, we see drops in physicians prescribing opioids, and we see drops in opioid overdoses, significant drops, like double-digit drops, over 20%. We also find that uh, in, in large observational studies, chronic pain patients will, they'll tell you that once they started using cannabis, uh, chronic pain patients who are already using opioids, they'll tell you that once they started using cannabis, that their, their opioid use went down. Now, there's never been a randomized controlled trial specifically looking at this, but the patients are reporting it. Now, um, I'm about to go through some potential ways that cannabis might mitigate opioid usage. So number one, could you potentially expose somebody before you give somebody opioids, which we know even a one-day a one dose of opioids, you can have like a four to five percent lifetime risk of opioid dependency from a one-day dose of opioids. Uh, could we give cannabis before to see if it's enough to treat their pain before we escalate to opioids? So could we prevent opioid exposure? And people who are already on opioids, can we give them cannabis and reduce the amount of opioids that they need because the cannabis and the opioids, they work synergistically for pain relief. Cannabis can boost the pain relieving effects of opioids and we have human data on this. So maybe before you needed 10 units of an opioid and now you need less because you have cannabis on board. Uh, there's also some data to suggest that THC can help with symptoms of opioid withdrawal. So in helping people wean off of opioids who are dependent on it. And lastly, uh, could it actually prevent relapse? And that's not so much THC, that's more CBD. So there's evidence that CBD can reduce cravings for opioids. And we actually are, are about to initiate one of the world's first human studies using CBD to reduce heroin cravings in people who've uh, recently uh, quit um, uh, heroin use. All right, sleep. So again, in, in either oral pure THC or a combo of 50-50 THC and CBD, we find that generally there's improvements in sleep outcomes, both in chronic pain patients as well as cancer patients. Now, the real question is, in the long run, what's the impact on sleep? These are short duration studies where the patients are saying, my sleep is better. You know, in the long run, we don't know if it's gonna necessarily improve or worsen sleep. Um, but that's also true of a lot of medications we give for sleep. The long-term data on it is not that great. Things like Ambien and whatnot. If you look at the long-term data, it doesn't actually seem to be improving your sleep in the long term. These are kind of short-term crutches that we use to help people fall asleep. All right, anxiety and depression, mood disorders. So that's where this is the most complicated part of my entire presentation. The data is not clear. So uh, if you talk to, if you survey people who are using cannabis for a medical condition, something like pain or HIV, for example you'll find that they also happen to report that their anxiety and depression gets a little better, okay? But these are not randomized controlled trials. These are observational studies. Now, if you look at recreational users, you actually tend to find that those that recreationally use cannabis, especially the ones that use it pretty heavily, they tend to be at maybe a little higher risk of developing depression or anxiety. But again, because these are observational studies, you don't, you don't know if it's chicken or egg. Are people who are more depressed using cannabis or does cannabis cause you to be more depressed? We're not quite sure. And here's the other thing. THC at low doses, we have well-controlled data that it can reduce anxiety. 
at high doses, it might precipitate anxiety, as I'm sure some of you who might have had that brownie at your friend's party might attest to. So it's a dosage thing, whereas CBD it's, appears to be anti-anxiety, uh, and, and there isn't a dose of CBD where it could actually increase your anxiety. All right, let's talk about the anti-tumor effects. And there's been a lot of caveats given here today, and I'm going to say the same caveat. We have no idea if this is going to work in humans. Um, and even if this we only have animal data as to the anti-tumor effects. And even if it did work in humans, again, is it, should we use THC? Should we use CBD? Should we use both? Are there other cannabinoids in the cannabis plant? What's the dose? Is it 10 milligrams? Is it 1,000 milligrams? How do you give it? Do I inject it into your blood? Do I make you eat it? Do I make you smoke it? What types of cancer might it be used for? And how do I combine it with chemo or therapy and radiation or surgery? Again, those are all, we have no idea. Okay, so the, the evidence of the anti-tumor effects of cannabis were first reported in this paper from the Medical College of Virginia in 1975, actually. They had received a special license. So back then, you weren't allowed to research cannabis. They had received a special license from the Drug Enforcement Agency, and they had received some funding to study how THC might be detrimental to the immune systems of uh, these animals that had cancer. So they took mice with tumors, they injected THC, and they found the tumor shrank. And so they reported their data, and they never got funded again, and they lost their license to study cannabis. And it wasn't until about 20 years later that another research group decided to pick this up. And that's when you kind of had the renaissance of, the of research into the anti-tumor effects. But for those 20 years, nobody around the world replicated this work or followed up on it, right? That's when politics interfered with science. All right, so in terms of the anti-tumor effects of, of these compounds, so both THC and CBD have been studied in animals, and they usually are administering pretty large doses, injecting it directly into the mice, which is very different than a human who just might be smoking low doses, right? Uh, we find multiple mechanisms through which they exhibit their anti-tumor effects. So number one, they can trigger apoptosis, which is cellular suicide. Number two, they can inhibit angiogenesis. They prevent the tumor's ability to call in blood vessels to feed it, so they can starve the cancer cells. And lastly, they inhibit metastasis, so the cancer cells can't spread. They're stuck uh, in their site of origin. And the other interesting thing is you don't find toxicity to healthy cells, so these are very selective to transformed cancerous cells. They have no toxicity to healthy cells. And furthermore, we find that in these animal studies, by themselves, you get anti-tumor effect, but you actually get synergy when you combine these cannabinoids with either radiation or chemotherapy. And the anti-tumor effects have been explored and shown in animals for everything from brain, lung, thyroid, breast, colon, and as well as pancreatic uh, cancers uh, of those origins. And I'll talk more about pancreatic cancer specifically and what we know. So there's been about four studies that have been done, none of them in humans. They've looked at both THC and CBD. Uh, they've and then one, uh, so both THC and CBD have exhibited anti-tumor effects in pancreatic cells in animals. Last year, there was a paper published specifically on ductal adenocarcinoma, and they found that when you combined CBD and gemcitabine, you had a 300% increase in survival of the mice than gemcitabine alone. And when they looked at why this happened, they saw that it, the CBD seemed to interfere with how the cancer cells gained gemcitabine resistance, which is a growing issue um, in, in, in a lot of cancers as well as CBD was an antagonist of the GPR55, which is, a, which is a, a, an oncoprotein. Okay, let's talk about adverse effects. So uh, if you look at some common substances and how many Americans they kill a year, you can see that you know, even things like uh, non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, ibuprofen, Motrin, Aleve, they kill about a few thousand Americans a year from gastrointestinal bleeding. Opioids killing 60,000 Americans a year and growing very rapidly, that's concerning. Now, for cannabis, it's pretty much zero Americans that die a year. And it's not just zero Americans a year. It's zero humans in recorded history have died from a direct overdose or direct acute toxicity from cannabis, okay? But just because nobody's dying doesn't mean that there aren't adverse effects. So let's talk about that. In the short term, it actually seems to be pretty well tolerated. The main si adverse effects, you get sleepiness, dizziness, and at high doses, paranoia and anxiety. Also, motor impairment. You have roughly a doubling of your increased risk of car accident while acutely stoned, so don't drive after using cannabis. And we generally don't find any serious adverse effects in these studies. 
Now, long term, there's a concern about lung health, people that smoke cannabis. Well, we find that heavy long term use smoking of combusted cannabis, no increased risk of lung cancer, no increased risk of emphysema or COPD, and no increased risk of opportunistic infections. Even in people who have HIV AIDS that are smoking cannabis, they don't have an increased risk of opportunistic infections. Um, concerned, we should be concerned about cannabis use disorder, right? About 9% of people who use cannabis will go on to develop an addic uh, a dependency to it uh, at some point in their lifetime. That's still lower than that of alcohol or tobacco or opioids, but it's not zero, okay? So this stuff is addictive. And uh, also, also, all these harms that I just talked about are generally due to THC, the sleepiness, the dizziness, the motor impairment. CBD doesn't really have too many side effects. And lastly, you should avoid THC if you have a family history of, of psychosis because it might increase the risk. It might increase the chances that you go from a genetic risk to actually having the disease. Also, you should avoid THC in general if you're pregnant. There's been some data that you have give birth to babies with lower birth weight, and if you're an adolescent, because it interferes with brain development. So those are the three groups of people that should avoid THC. Okay, here are the big takeaways. So uh, again, we don't really know what pure CBD does, but we know that pure THC, a combo of THC with CBD, or cannabis that is just predominantly THC, they can do a few things. It seems to benefit nausea, appetite, chronic pain, and sleep. It might reduce opioids. There's data to suggest that. Uh, the dose really depends on the users. So you really gotta start with a low dose and slowly, slowly, slowly titrate up if you're interested. Uh, there's, so, there's huge differences in what is an effective dose for you and you in all of these studies. Um, low dose THC might be enough for uh, some of your symptoms, especially around pain. You don't necessarily need to get high. Uh, there's an unclear effect on mood, very little data on CBD only. In terms of the adverse effects, they're mainly driven by THC. In the short term, they're generally non-serious, things like sleepiness, uh, dizziness. In the long term, there's certain groups of people that should avoid it. Uh, family history of schizophrenia, pregnancy, adolescence are the main three groups that come to mind. And in terms of the anti-tumor effects, uh, we need human clinical research. Um, and that's the real caveat of all of this, is that the re you know, how, how, people ask me, how is it that something that's been around for thousands of years hasn't been studied? Well, it's because there was systematic research barriers and, and systematic defunding of work in this area. Even to this day, it's still classified as a schedule one drug by the federal government. Highest potential for abuse, no medical use. And because of that, if I want to secure federal funds to study the medical use of cannabis, I can't. And it's been that way for 50 years, so it continues to this day. But, you know, we're hopeful. There's more interest growing every day in this area. And thank you very much, and we can take questions now. Hi, it's me again. <laughs> um, so I use CBD, pure CBD, for my spondyloarthritis, and a lot of our patients um, use it for pain uh, and nausea, and we've found that pure CBD has been helpful. So um, I can find human subjects if you'd like. <laughs> so, um, however, I just wanted to mention, um, we, I, we did a little research on it, and if you do take um, blood thinners, it can enhance the... Um, the uh, effect of the blood thinning. Uh, so to watch out, because I know a lot of people that have pancreatic cancer have portal vein thrombosis or something that they would be on long-term um, you know, blood thinning agents. And then also um, hypertension, it helps with the hypertension. So again, keep your blood sugar or your blood pressures because it'll enhance blood pressure medications too. That's the two side effects I've heard. Does that correlate with you? Great point. So again, if you look at um, anecdotally, in, in surveys, people report pure CBD working for a host of conditions. There just hasn't ever been clinical trials. And yes, the main real kind of adverse effect of CBD is how it interacts with other drugs. So just be vigilant, tell your doctor what you're using. But we generally see those effects at really high doses of CBD, like several hundred milligrams a day. Whereas in my conversations with patients, they're generally taking 10, 20 milligrams a day. So we don't, we don't really know if it's going to do anything in that. We're taking about 100 dosage. a day. Yeah. Oh, so some of the patients you're yeah. seeing are taking 100. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. I have a question over here. Uh, first of all, thank you for the work you're doing. Uh, I'm newly diagnosed and just started looking into medical cannabis. And I just saw a report on the news where they went to dispensaries and purchased various edibles, I think around 
20 or 30, had them tested, and I think only one had any CBD at all. So the question I, I have is, is the stuff that you're getting from dispensaries, is there any regulation, are there any guarantees that you're getting what they say you're getting? Such a great question. So, um, just, so just so you guys understand, right now in Los Angeles, there are about 150 licensed cannabis stores. There's about 1,500 unlicensed ones. Wow. Okay, now, if you walk into a licensed store, how do you know it's licensed? You can look up the list on the LA City website. If you walk into a licensed dispensary, you can be sure, or pretty darn sure, the product you're buying is accurately labeled and free of contaminants. In fact, if you walk into a licensed cannabis store, any product you buy in there, you can be 10 times more confident that it is accurate and clean compared to even the strawberries you buy at Whole Foods, compared to the echinacea you buy at the grocery store. Because California regulates its legal cannabis market very stringently, and the pesticide requirements are unheard of in the agricultural world, okay? That's only if you walk into a licensed dispensary. Now, the hemp-derived CBD that you can buy online, you can buy at the grocery store, none of that is licensed. And so the study that you're referring to is probably they went around ordering these things from online and all this stuff. And that's because hemp is legal at the federal level. So people take federally legal hemp, they pull out the CBD, and this is not a narcotic. It's not a controlled substance. That's why they can sell it online and sell it in grocery stores. So the, ca the, the bottom line is if you are really interested in using cannabis or CBD or THC and you want to be sure that what you're getting is free of contaminants and is accurate, you got to go to a cannabis dispensary because those are really stringently regulated by the state and make sure that the one you're going to is licensed because the unlicensed ones outnumber the licensed ones 10 to 1. And is there a website you could check? Did you say it was city yeah, regulated uh, or uh, state? Yeah, go to the, the LA City Department of Cannabis Regulation. I'm sure you can find, that's where you can find a website, a list of all the licensed uh, deliverers and stores. Okay, thank you. So I'm an oncology nurse and I've been giving out uh, Marinol for years, but I don't actually know which it is. And also, uh, my pay I don't know whether it's, it's uh, THC <laughs> or CBD. Marinol's I'm THC. THC? Yeah. Oh, completely? 100% pure synthetic THC. Well, that's is, interesting. Is my patients always say it's more effective to smoke it than to take the Marinol. <laughs> right. So um, that, that is a common refrain you'll hear from patients. And it, we don't, it, could, it could be due to pharmacokinetics. So when you take Marinol, uh, the onset is slow. The onset is also very, it's variable. Um, depending on whether or not, for instance, you've had a meal before, whereas if you smoke it, the effects are immediate and more predictable. The other thing is cannabis is not THC. Um, like I said, cannabis contains hundreds of compounds, uh, and it, the other theory that has never been proven is that cannabis, the plant, has a combination of compounds that might be more effective than pure CBD or pure THC. Again, it's just a hypothesis. That, that science needs to prove. We need to, we need to look at this. I, I, I had a question. First of all, thank you so much for enlightening all of us. Okay. Do you know of any other universities that are involved in a cannabis initiative? Yeah, so uh, within, so in, in all of the US, within, especially within the last uh, year or so, several have popped up. So, so Berkeley has started a cannabis program looking at the environmental impacts. Irvine, UC Irvine's doing a lot of work on animal studies, uh, involved, trying to understand how it impacts brain development in animal models of THC, trying to understand what it might do to adolescents. Um, Jefferson University in, in Philadelphia is doing a lot of stuff. And a lot of the research I cited here was actually done at UC San Diego. And that's because 20 years ago, the state of California uh, had, was prescient enough to fund some of the first ever human clinical trials of cannabis for its medical use, because the feds would not fund benefit research. They would only fund research into the harms. So the state of California funded some research at UC San Diego, and that's why we know it can be helpful for things like pain and whatnot. So California's been a pioneer in this all along. Yeah. Hi, I've been using um, cannabis, I vape, uh, probably about three times a day and it I have to say I'm allergic to morphine and um, I they took me off most of the oral or all the oral stuff and put me on the, the fentanyl patch and I have to tell you I hardly even wear those because the marijuana that I have it takes care of my anxiety my pain isn't as bad I can stand it 
And uh, like I say, I think it helps with the inflammation too because uh, I noticed if I do it regularly, I have a more agile and I can do more. And um, I just have to say, I just, I'm really happy with it. I, uh, the one thing about the edibles, um, they ended up taking my, pan my whole pancreas, so I'm diabetic now. And if you look at those labels and any of the edibles or drinks, it's incredibly high in sugar. It is terrible for you. <laughs> I, do, I do with no sugar gummies. Oh, do you? Oh, okay. So yeah, I, I haven't seen anything sugar-free yet because I, I tell them all the time, you know, when I see reps and stuff, that they should put a, a line out for diabetics. So, so you, could get, um, you could get, in these stores, you could get capsules that are just cannabis oil without mm -hmm. sugar or flour of the other materials. Uh -huh. It might not be as fun to eat, but yeah, so there's... Yeah. There's options. Uh, I'm doing okay you. with the baby. Yeah, got it. Okay. <laughs> but I, I just wanted to mention that I, I'm really happy, and it's it's. I think it's made a big difference. I just sure. added. Um, I have another uh, survivor that does hemp works, and I got a sample of theirs, and they give you like, I think for like twelve dollars, you get like four or five packets that are just already mixed, and then they have the dropper, hmm. and so I'll, I'll find out how the two work together. But it was a big difference, like I say, um, with uh, not overusing the fentanyl patches and everything because of the uh, addiction. And the other thing that really helps with me is that anytime I have anything like the patch of that, I itch so bad. So it's almost like I have to take antihistamines to counter it. So it's like a, like a low high, you know, you're both ways and it just didn't make me feel good in that. But I, it was very interesting, thank you. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. Do you have, I just want a quick, do you know any, d the difference between sativa and like indica, mm -hmm. that kind of thing, can you say anything about yeah, that? Yeah, so um, sativa and indica are, 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 are physical descriptors of cannabis. So uh, a, a sativa plant, you can think the S, it helps you remember it's slender. So sativa plants tend to be thin and tall with very thin, long leaves. Indica plants tend to be shorter, bushier, with thicker leaves. They tend to show up in different parts of the world. But somewhere, somehow, this myth started sprouting up that sativa plants tend to be more energetic and uplifting, whereas indica plants tend to be more sedating and relaxing. And there's very little, there's no evidence that the physical characteristics of the plant really affect the chemical makeup inside and therefore affect what it, how it makes you feel. So the short answer is that's a complete myth, the sativa indica thing. And also nowadays, all the sativa indica is so interbred, nothing's ever a true sativa indica anymore. Um, and that, now also on myths, this is one that I, I should have mentioned. So uh, CBD is CBD is CBD. Whether you get CBD that's made in a lab, CBD from hemp, or CBD from marijuana that chemical is the same. It's gonna do the same thing. The real question is, what else is delivered with it? So synthetic CBD in a lab is not gonna have anything else. CBD from marijuana, it's gonna have some THC and some other things. CBD from hemp, it's not gonna have THC, right? So it's not really, is, is the CBD from marijuana or hemp better? You're really just talking about how is the whole product from hemp or the whole product from marijuana going to affect me differently? That's the question that you should be asking. Um, and I think uh, we can bounce back to you. Yeah, um, maybe last two questions and then we'll, okay. Yeah, you're up. Great, thank you. Um, I have found because since the inception of this, I've been on a lot of CBD oil and doing the THC too, but separate and having some outstanding effects. And also because I'm even involved in a really great company who tests them all and every company that's really organic and is pure will have those standardized testing on every batch of products that they do, which, ma which makes me feel comfortable for the products I use. In addition to that, anybody who has ever had a lovely Whipple attack, which is pretty horrible and intense, I have um, immediately like put on the um, tincture oil on it, and I'm telling you, it immediately took 100% of the pain away. And I was able to just breathe and it has been outstanding. Did you apply it topically or yep. you ate it yep. topically? Yep, topically. Yeah. Great, thank you. So here's the other, here's the other thing. Um, topical cannabis 
it's never been studied in a single clinical trial. But again, anecdotally, people will talk about how they use topical cannabis for um, everything from menstrual cramps to muscle aches to arthritis. But it's just, you know, we don't have rigorous science data to know what what's it's doing, how it's being absorbed in the skin. So we don't, you know, it's, unfortunately, it's just anecdotal right now. And then last question. Uh, so I use CBD from hemp, and I have used it from the marijuana plant. And I also use THC from the marijuana plant. I have, my question is, do you know if the CBD that's um, water soluble is any better or better absorbed than ones that are not water sol soluble? Um, so the question was about water solubility of cannabinoids. So the first thing is a lot of companies will claim to have water soluble cannabinoids and it's just they, the, the technology is not there. Uh, yeah, and so it's not actually water soluble or it's, it's temporarily water soluble and it sits on a shelf for a few days and all the cannabinoids fall out of the liposomes and then it's just, it's not. So I, w I wouldn't say necessarily is water soluble uh, better or worse because all of these companies, the technology isn't that sophisticated in my opinion. Um, in terms of, oh, well that, that actually reminds me of another thing. Uh, cannabinoids are very poorly absorbed in your GI system. And if you take them with fats and oil, they absorb better because they are lipophilic compounds. Um, but, uh, but going back to your question, we've, there's never been studies on how uh, uh, water-soluble cannabinoids are better or worse absorbed, unfortunately. I have not heard of Zelise. Yeah. Okay, thank you guys.